Okay, let's see here. Hi, well, I guess let's go ahead and get started if you want to, Carl, if that works for you. Sure, yeah, did you? Okay. I, I will, uh, I think you have to get, uh, let's see if I can share the screen. Yep. Give, me, give me a second, let me do the, the formal introduction there and then we'll get the ball rolling. Great. All right, everybody, welcome to tonight's uh, industry webinar. This is Diego Mello with Stradaventures. Um, for those of you that are now joining us, we have Carl Zollner joining us from Anderson Legal Business and Tax Advisors. And today we're going to be talking about asset protection planning for your real estate investments. Um, for those of you that don't know about Strata Ventures, please feel free to go ahead and scan the QR code and you'll get to know more about us. Um, we're going to have the webinar welcome and then our topic information begins around 635 and then we'll hopefully finish around 710 and then we'll open that up to our guest speaker to answer some questions. For those of you that are joining us uh, via Zoom, obviously this is the Zoom platform. Remember your questions should be asked in the Q&A section. I don't think we have any polls this evening, but any other questions outside of topic or to get information, please feel free to go to the chat box and get to uh, have Enid or Oriana and answer those for you. And if Diego becomes boring, I know it's not gonna be you, Carl. I always say if Diego becomes boring, uh, feel free to leave the webinar, but we'll see you in another two weeks because this event is for you guys. That's why we encourage a ton of questions and we'll be happy to get to those in our Q&A section. Uh, for myself, Diego, I was born in Columbia, South America, moved to the United States at the age of four. I live in Houston, Texas, prior mortgage banker and asset manager, and I began investing in May of 2012 and launching us forward into 2020 and 22. Um, our company now is in over 24 states, and I think we hit 2,100 members nationally. And we are stoked to have you guys, Andersons, as one of our main partners because Guess what? Everybody needs financial and business and legal tax advice, and you guys are the best. Um, our company was established in May of 2012, and we are a full service real estate investing company, which has the four prongs of business, which are acquisition analysis, real estate services, property and uh, project management and contracting services, and most of all funding. And obviously without those, we can't work with companies uh, like, you, like yours, Carl, because representation and protection is everything. Here is our team SVI, which comprises from every walk of life in real estate, from marketing to sales, to social media, real estate services, home inspection, con construction, architectural engineering, and, and funding. Um, and I always like to say this, Carl, at all of our webinars, is that we like to make sure that people understand what role they play in real estate. So the definition of a real estate investor of SVI is a real estate investor analyzes, acts, invests, makes profit with one word in mind, and that's risk. Hence, why people need to use people in companies such as yourself, Carl, and Anderson Advisors. Correct me if I'm wrong here. These are going to be the key topics of conversation today. How to use entities to keep from getting your expletive sued off. <laughs> why your current asset protection plan could be killing the growth of your real estate business and, and you don't even know it, and learn the advantages of an LLC versus a corporation when investing in real estate, and the secret language of land trust and why this should be part of every real estate investor's plan. Am I good on those topics? You are good on those topics. The only caveat I would say is there's probably at least a couple hours of material at minimum on each of those. So as long as everybody... Uh, agrees we can't get it all probably all in today as far as your real estate investing and risk knowledge. Perfect. So I'll go ahead now and tee this off to you. I'm going to escape uh, from there and go ahead, Carl, if you want to go ahead and share your presentation. And we, I'm still we... getting the cannot start screen share while other participants are sharing. All right. There you go. Cool. Let's try it. All right. That's better. And that do my little thing here. Uh, let's see, Diego, are you seeing my note section as well, or just the? I see your presentation, your key presentation, no notes section. Cool, that'll work. Uh, All right, Enid or Oriana, can we get thumbs up on uh, Carl's uh, view there? Uh, let's take a look. Yep. All good. 
Cool. Good. All right. So welcome everyone. And thank you, Diego, for such a nice introduction. Uh, I am an attorney. You can probably also see the little sign my wife got me a couple of years back for Christmas as well. Um, a little bit about our intro tonight, like I said, uh, fair commitment to you is I will give you as much information as I can with the time I've got, but I can't give you everything, right? It's taken years and hundreds of thousands of dollars <laughs> to, to sort of learn what I've looked or what, what I've learned over the years and learned from uh, the partners at Anderson, Toby Mathis, Clint Coons, and Michael Bowman. But I will, like I said, I'll share as much as I can with you this evening as part of the beginning of your education process on how to learn or step up the analysis side or uh, understanding risk management a little bit better here. So who's Anderson Advisors? Most of you have probably heard of us before if you're involved on YouTube or if you are have been basically even Googling around at this point in the real estate market, I'm sure you have come across probably a couple of our ads. Uh, overall, I'll tell you this, we are a premier education company. We teach in the area of tax and asset protection. Um, and unlike a lot of our uh, other companies out there, we also empl employ attorneys and CPAs so we can execute the strategies we're teaching you. So, um, that's who we are, number one, was we're an education company. Next is we've got clients across all 50 states. So we are well situated to help anybody basically investing in any area. Uh, when I'm talking to a group that has some, I guess, ties to Texas, I always talk about as well, usually our biggest concentration of clients is in California and Texas. I myself am licensed in Texas. I grew up in Texas. And I'll touch on my, basically on my, on my background here in just a moment. Who does Anderson Advisor serve? Basically anybody who invests in the U.S. So I wouldn't say foreign nationals are our specialty, uh, but if you already have your ITIN or have some way that you're investing, we can help you from an asset protection side, most likely even give you a little bit of guidance on the tax side here on the U.S. side. If you are a foreign national and are investing in the US, the tax side in your home country, you would need to work with somebody over there to make sure everything's flowing how you want. Most commonly you run into, or I guess we run into, tends to be folks like, uh, that are you know, Canadians or uh, from Mexico that wanna do the investments on this side. So those are pretty common, but uh, yeah, as far as if you have an Indian friend or something who wants to invest and wants tax and asset protection, we can help on the U.S. side, but the home side is where they'll need to have also the same type of help to make sure they're not smacking themselves around with taxes. A um, little bit about myself. Uh, number one is I'm here because I love to teach. Uh, I loved, you know, pre-COVID meeting everybody in person and, you know, always, you know, the cocktail hours and free deep meals. I always used to joke when I spent a ton of time in Texas when we were live and in person as well. It's like in legitimately, you could probably hop around town and never have to buy a meal uh, for all the investor classes and offerings that are out there. So uh, really enjoyed, te I really enjoy teaching in person. I've done events that are from anywhere from five minutes long where I have just a couple minutes to talk all the way up to five days or more. So I'll, we're sort of on the uh, short side today, but like I said, uh, really enjoy teaching. So I'll try to get you to the content as quick as possible. Uh, a little bit more about me. I already mentioned I'm an attorney. I also trade stocks, real estate investor, and also a cryptocurrency investor. So like most of y'all, if I see something that is likely to make money, I'm probably going to throw at least a little bit of money at it. Uh, to see what kind of return it is. Along with that, and sort of like Diego mentioned as well, comes a the experience or the also analysis on the risk management, sort of the difference between an amateur and pro is the risk management, whether that comes to stock trading, real estate investing, pretty much anything. But once you understand the risk, you can manage it. So I look at it as part of my role here to help you understand some of the risks that are out there not as a deterrent, uh, because still to this day, real estate is the quickest way to grow your sort of wealth in America today, especially with these inflation rates and things like that. 
and the loan rates still being relatively low. They went up a little bit, but they're still relatively low. Uh, still a great investment out there. So like I said, it's more about understanding risk than it is fearing it. Uh, my specialty is working with small business owners and real estate investors to help them keep more of what they earn and limit their liability. So it could be keep more of what you earn, meaning keep it away from plaintiffs or keep more of what you earn by doing some tax planning and not overpaying in taxes. We believe in paying your fair share, but we don't want to leave a tip when it comes to the taxes, mostly too, because that can be the difference between a successful investment and one you took a loss on. So if we can help save there, we do. So um, I like to quote smart people before I start talking so I can trick y'all into thinking I'm smart too. So if you can't explain it simply, you do not understand it well enough, you probably have already gotten from the initial pre piece of the presentation here. I'm not going to try to blow your mind with anticipatory repudiations and all this, you know, sort of deep legal knowledge and legalese and try to confuse you. I'm going to try to speak plainly. So we're all speaking the same language. So that way, when you ask questions and I answer you, we're speaking the same language. I think a lot of professionals out there miss the boat on that. And they try to speak over their clients or try to make themselves sound smarter so that, you know, people think they're getting their values worth. My ultimate goal and my personal thought is, is if we can't understand each other or you can't grasp the information I'm trying to teach you, then I'm not doing a great job teaching. So I try to keep it, number one, straightforward and simple because that's the sort of person I am. And I've found over the years that clients like that. So I'm going to keep doing it. <laughs> a couple things to touch on here, really, when you talk about an overall plan for a business, especially an investing business, one is asset protection. We want to take a look at asset protection side, uh, tax planning, right? Keeping more of what you earn. Business planning, which is also a tough one to find good professionals on, because ultimately, I don't know. Most people out there who've been investing for a while can tell you stories about being bounced around between their attorneys and CPAs because an attorney only wants to talk about asset protection. CPA only wants to talk about taxes. And then you just get sort of volleyballed back and forth until you settle on something. And probably most people who end up settling on something is an LLC tax as an S corporation. That's a little bit of tax advice, a little bit of legal and everybody sort of thinks that's right. And it's not in every single scenario. There might be some where it is, like a services business. But for most folks as investors, it's probably not the best position to be in. Uh, but it takes somebody actually looking at your overall plan and your overall situation to say, this is the right type of entity, the right type of taxation to help you accomplish what you're going to do. And then finally, the sort of I don't know, leg of the stool that tends to be most forgotten is estate planning. Most people out there think they are okay with a will or no estate plan at all. With a will or no estate plan at all, your, your uh, assets will be going through probate. Probate is a bad deal because on average, it takes about 18 months and will cost you around about $14,000. So if you ever wondered when you drove by and saw those billboards that said, you know, wills, $99 or $199. How do they do that? It's because they're expecting to take a small loss on the drafting of the will. So, you know, if my normal drafting times or my normal hourly rate, $750 an hour, and I do your will and I charge you $99, how am I making it back? I make it back when you die because statistically the family is likely to go to the uh, attorney that created the will when the person whose estate it was referencing passes. So basically they lose a little on the front end to gain a lot on the back, kind of a gross area of the law. But their good news is, is there is a tool out there where you can avoid probate and that tool is called a living trust. So it's one of those cool areas that, you know, we happen to still have the laws in place where everybody can take advantage and not have to be forced through that sort of more costly and cumbersome system. You actually have the ability to take the express lane if you choose it. So we'll talk a little bit about that 
as well, just because, you know, we're sort of all building something for a reason. We can't take it with us. So what we're going to, you know, who we're going to leave it to or leave it behind for, we want them to get those assets. So kids, grandkids, whomever, we don't want some attorney getting them uh, because it was too expensive to probate this thing, the thing. And all of a sudden the assets go back to the state or the assets have to be sold to pay the attorney. It's a bad place to be. So estate planning, like I said, it's one of probably one of the most important things in your overall entity structure. But I like to always note it because sometimes when we get running with, you know, the business stuff, we tend to forget about the why we're building something, right? Or that the why that we can't bring it with us. So good to mention there too. Now, first concept here we, we're going to talk about our business entities provide separation. So whether I set up an LLC or a corporation, those provide separation between myself and my business, okay? So if you think of it or visualize it, like an LLC or corporation as a box, think of the way you're drawing the lines or the border of the box as what's providing that separation. So the neat part is, is I can not only create a box to separate my business from my person, but I can also create a box to separate different investments from each other. So this is when we start talking about risk management, how risk management is important. One piece to mention as well, it's a little bit counterintuitive in the mind, but it's actually more important for separation of those assets in the beginning than it is further down the road. Dealt with many folks who thought, okay, well, once I have, you know, 10 properties, then I'll consider it. Okay, well, you could, but I'll tell you this, if, you if you're that person out there that has one or two properties and you lose one or both of those properties, that's a, you know, 50 to 100% loss versus if I've got 30, 40 properties and lose two or three, that's sort of a different, that's a different scenario there. So it's a little bit counterintuitive in that most people think, oh, I'll do the right things once I have the necessarily have the money at hand to do them. But I'll tell you, it's almost more important in the beginning to protect each one of those individual assets because of the sacrifice and sort of the percentage <laughs> of your time, money, and effort they took to put together versus as you start to get momentum, and you usually start talking about things like, you know, if I got 30 properties, maybe then it starts to make sense to group some of those properties in LLCs. That way I've got some level of risk, but it's palatable risk. If you're talking about losing, you know, half or hundred percent of your portfolio in one day, that's tough, especially for those folks who said, oh, well, I'll do it later and then come back only after they've been sued and lost everything. That's always a tough conversation to have as well. So I would say there is a reasonable plan and a reasonable place for everybody to start. It doesn't have to be at the most expensive end, but I also wouldn't wait too long because the liability side of what you need to plan for is unpredictable, right? It's, you know, what's the newest mold claim or what's the, you know, sort of lawsuit du jour out there that everybody wants to take advantage of. And so you don't necessarily even know that you're gonna be subject to it until you get that paperwork in the mail. And at that point, it's too late. So like I said, it's important to plan for that piece because you don't know if and when it's coming. Statistically, it's when it's coming, it's not if. So on average, the average real estate investor gets sued five times during the course of their investing career. I will tell you from my experience, I believe the average for a couple of reasons. Number one, is I've met 60, 70 year old folks who have never been and been doing real estate investing for 50 years. And I have seen them and they have never been sued. I don't know if they got just an extra portion of luck, you know, when they were coming off the, man the manufacturing line or what. But I have also met people who've been re investing in fifth for 15 minutes and been sued 10 times. So like I said, I believe the average because I've seen sort of the, the luck side swing both ways. Uh, so like I said, you got to sort of plan for the 
I was going to say unpredictable, but it actually is somewhat predictable that you are likely to be involved in a lawsuit at some point when it comes to investing. And, and Carl, let me step in there for one second. That is, guys, if, if you're listening to Carl, that is one of the most important things that, that when you start working with Anderson Advisors is that they're technically forecasting your growth. And when they're forecasting your growth is you're preparing yourself to have a solid foundation because as you continue to stack liability and growth, you better have a strong foundation because <laughs> somebody told me, you know, it's, it's not um, if you need an attorney, it's when you need an attorney. And that's where this thing comes into play. So I wanted to, to basically say these things that Carl's saying right now is, should be resonating um, and, and, and the structure of working with somebody like Anderson. So thanks, Carl. Yeah, no problem. And it goes into the whole sort of concept of what we're looking at here. So it's important. I'm, like I said, I love to teach, number one, but also I love working for a company that we're working on the, if you look at it kind of like medicine, we're working on the preventative side of medicine versus the emergency care. If say I hung my, I had my own law practice and hung a shingle in Texas to run my own business. Um, as you can imagine, sort of just like medicine, what do you think's more, more reasonably priced? Sort of the preventative side, you know, taking care of yourself, uh, eating right, exercising, that sort of a thing. Or when you're, you know, have to be ru rushed to an emergency room and are sort of willing to pay anybody anything to make it through to the other side. Same thing happens for those of you who haven't been sued, you know, God bless you. I hope you don't hope it never happens. Uh, but if you do, you do sort of feel that same sense of urgency, especially if you know you don't have the right plan in place. So like I said, I like and enjoy working on the preventative side of, I guess, law, you'd call it, not medicine in this case. Um, but a little planning goes a long way. So I'm trying to remember who said it. It was like a, uh, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Maybe it was like a Teddy Roosevelt or something. I don't remember that one, but... Uh, same sort of deal. A little bit of planning on the front end makes you far less um, susceptible on the back end. Uh, I tell this story from time to time when I do a presentation. And it's always great. I was in uh, North Texas going to law school and up in the Fort Worth area. And I, you know, law school is not cheap. So I was working 60, 65 hours a week. Uh, I, then I was also my wife and I had just bought a house. The house we bought was in a neighborhood that turned over when there was that small oil bubble burst um, around, what was it, 20? Well, around that period of time, whenever that was. Um, and so the neighborhood was turning over. There was a few foreclosures, uh, no significant crime rate, but small little vehicle break-ins, things like that. And quite frankly, I didn't have the cash on hand to be paying for an ADT uh, security system. I wanted like four grand at the time for it. And, but what I did have was an eBay account and access to buy the stickers and yard signs. So I put that on my house because I figured I don't have to have Fort Knox here to <laughs> basically to deter people uh, from trying to break into my house. I just need to look less appealing than my neighbor. And part of the strategies I like from Anderson as well is, is you, you know, some of the stuff is you just don't have to be the lowest hanging fruit, right? If I've got a bunch of stuff in my individual name and somebody can go out and do an asset search and see everything I own, I'm low hanging fruit. If I use things like a business entity or a land trust to hold title to a property and you can't see my individual name directly, all of a sudden now I've been taken out of sort of that first category of folks that would be easy to attack. And now all of a sudden you're putting the risk on the attorney that's gonna pursue the case. Cause in most cases, the attorney is going to be working on contingency, especially when we start talking about things like tenants and people's ability to pay. So contingency from a fee standpoint, an attorney means the attorney is taking a percentage of the judgment. So they're basically willing to front the cost of your litigation in order to help share in the profits. So all of a sudden, if you remove the either likelihood of them winning or the pot of gold at the end of that rainbow altogether, now it becomes more risky for someone like, you know, for an attorney to take that case. 
because now that picture of what's it gonna be at the end of the road isn't quite so clear. So what does that do? It knocks off a pretty good chunk there of the P of, uh, you know, lawsuits that are just thrown up as wild goose chases or shakedowns, because now you're saying, okay, attorney, if you're, if you want to take this risk, you can take this risk, but you're putting some of your own dollars at risk and time at risk for something that's not guaranteed. So in a world where you're working from that plan, what does it make more sense? It makes more sense to go after things that have sort of a guaranteed end or uh, for another fun saying there, sort of that bird in the hand is worth two in the bush type of mentality, because ultimately you need, if you, you know, got to keep the lights on and, you know, uh, utilities on and things too. And most attorneys, especially attorneys out there working for themselves or have their own legal practices, they're saying yes to everything, right? I mean, anybody who's been in business or started a business or small business, uh, you can certainly probably relate to that. And you just say yes and make it work. And, you know, you learn a new skill. So I say that to say this too, is ultimately the folks that do tax and asset protection out there, uh, last statistic I saw was 0.1 of a percentage point of attorneys that do that. So just as you're, so you're aware, just because you got a nephew or niece or family member who's an attorney does not mean they are an asset protection attorney or that you should let them draft your business documents uh, just because it's specialized. I mean, anybody out there who has a, you know, your, your day, your work day, your passion or something you've spent years and years on. And then you see somebody who's an amateur that thinks they can do as well. Same sort of concept, right? I wouldn't go to, if I needed, you know, knock on wood, if I needed brain surgery or something, I wouldn't go to a podiatrist to do it. I would go to somebody who that was their bread and butter. And that's what they did every single day and could probably do it in the sleep, in their sleep with their, you know, in, in their sleep if they needed to. So just as a FYI there, cause I do, we do, of course, right. Everybody's got some family member who's an attorney and most every attorney who doesn't specialize in this can, do, will just tell you, oh yeah, well, I can just set it up with the secretary of state and that's about it. Yeah. Except it's not every state in the union says, unless otherwise stated in your basically governing documents, this is the rule. So if you've got some amateur doing it, you can likely even be stepping on your protections, especially in a state like Texas, where Texas actually has pretty good asset protection laws. Um, if you screw up the operating agreement or bylaws, uh, you can actually be in potentially in a worse place than if you didn't have them at all. So it's not something, like I said, sort of not something that lots of people think about, but it is possible. So my next slide here, trust all our solves for common investing issues. Um, specifically, the pieces I'm talking about here are things like land trusts, which you can use for an additional layer of anonymity and can hold title to property. Uh, what's nice is if you use a nominee trustee, now you've got control over your property and nobody can see the owner. So it's a great tool to have out there, have lots of clients who even use them as the medium to do subject to deals. So you hold title in sort of that, I don't know, middle as a equitable entity there. So that, you know, the, the seller doesn't feel too weird about it. You don't feel like you're, you know, you're hanging out the window by your shorts. Um, so there's lots of great uses for them really as well, depending on where you invest. Land trusts are very useful for avoiding things like transfer taxes, or if you're investing in Florida, like documentary, uh, documentary stamp taxes, land trusts have, there's a provision that those avoid there because they're grantor trusts. So common problems for land trust, great to help avoid transfer tax, stamp tax, as well as provide a level of anonymity. So if that's sort of interesting to you and want to know more, there's, you know, like I said, I could probably do a couple of hours on each of these sections, but that's sort of the 10 foot, 10,000 foot view on that one. Then I talked a little bit about your living trust, just to sort of reiterate, the key there is it'll help you avoid probate. And how does it work? The reason it helps you avoid probate is, well, with no estate plan at all, certainly we can all understand the judge has to make the decisions. 
with a will, a will is just a list of instructions from a legal perspective. So the judge still needs to decide whether they're going to follow those instructions or not. In a living trust, it is a entity that can hold title to property. So ultimately, when you pass, although everybody will be sad, the trust is actually what holds all of your property. Um, a great way to sort of envision this is a living trust. If you picture it sort of like a suitcase, it can hold all of your assets separately. And then the trustee controls what happens. So when you pass, what happens is the successor trustee steps in and distributes your assets as you see fit. So that way it doesn't need to go through court to be able to do that. So like I said, gives you your best shot of avoiding probate there. Now, a comprehensive plan is crucial. There are several things when it comes to a plan that you need to look at or that you can use us to look at for you. Number one is, and I just actually had a client consult a little bit before this presentation too. So I sort of ran through these details, but ultimately we talked about what she's doing now, what assets she has, and what is she going to or wants to be doing moving forward? Because it's important to, do, to look at those aspects of it to know where you're going, right? I mean, if you're, I don't know, if you're an 86-year-old person who's sort of ready for toes in the sand time and you have enough revolving income coming in to support you, then it probably is not super valuable or helpful if we're planning or set you up in a structure that makes you the most lendable as possible, right? I mean, if I'm sort of in a holding mode or I've sort of hit the number that I need to be comfortable and I'm sort of on the, on the backside of, uh, <laughs> on, on the life curve, then that's completely different than somebody who's coming in, you know, maybe in their late teens, early twenties, has their first rental property and is looking to be the next, you know, real estate mogul or billionaire, right? Because I mean, ultimately, we've got to take those things into account from both liability side and the tax side to make sure that if we're trying to create a picture that also makes you the most lendable as possible, then we, then we sort of check those boxes as well. So the comprehensive plan is important. We term it as our wealth planning blueprint. So we, when you meet with us and you have a consultation, we'll actually sit down and give you a visual depiction of the structure we've talked about with you. So you can have a I get, I mean, just a, a picture that you can reference of how the entities are stacked together. Um, one thing that we do as well is we put a value on anonymity as well, because ultimately for that same reason or that same strategy about taking away some of those things that are driving forces for attorneys to see, like your assets just sitting out there. When we add anonymity to the mix, it helps remove that pot of gold from the end of the rainbow. So we make it as part of the plan. Now, how do we do that? We do that by using entities in states that have the highest order of asset protection, as well as offer a level of anonymity. So in Wyoming, which is our probably most common state these days that we use for say our holding companies, um, Wyoming does not require that a member or manager is listed on the Secretary of State website. They only ask for organizer when you're setting up the entity. And if we're setting up the entity, it's one of our employees. So you'll still have, you still have full ownership and control. It's just not on public record. By the way, that's one of the things that people screw up the most when they do it, on, try to do it on their own, uh, which I certainly wouldn't suggest, is ultimately if you're a one person shop, you're probably still putting your name on there as organizer, which isn't going to be super helpful. So just as a FYI there as well. And Carl, when when working with you guys on the comprehensive plan, <clears throat> it's very key that that when they ask you questions, you're just there to trigger more questions, right? Because with that, it helps then you evolve more into in the direction that they're wanting to go because they don't know your side of the business and you're there to kind of pull, you know, pull, keep pulling and pulling information out because at that way you have a better you can build a better game plan for them. And so guys, it never hurts to, to just have a meeting, have a conversation and see where that goes. Um, with Toby, the first time I met Toby, started talking to him, turned out to be a four hour conversation. 
that's how good you guys are. So, so wanted to again, share that information with everybody and don't hesitate to uh, put in some questions here um, for, for the future. Yeah, great. Yeah, yeah. Keep asking questions along the way because I'll leave some room as well. Uh, and like Diego said too, it's literally when we, we when you sit down for a consultation, we'll have you fill out what's referred to as our strategy session questionnaire because it gives us threads to pull so we can say, okay, I, well, you, you listed a rental property. Tell me about, you know, these sort of things. I mean, my last conversation, we even went as far as uh, she was talking about, uh, there was a lady I was speaking with who was talking about putting solar panels on her property, which I like, and I'm actually doing for my own personal residence because it's also a 26% uh, tax break on the actual system itself, not including any state benefits that, that's out there. So there's lots of these little cool areas. So yeah, number one is sort of a good rule of thumb is don't hide stuff from an attorney they're talking to if the attorney's there to help you. Um, because ultimately, unless you give them the full picture, it's gonna be hard to draw the full picture. And I'm sure that sounds sort of silly or funny to a lot of you out there, but you'd be surprised how much it happens, especially, especially sort of uh, depending culturally how you're raised. If you were raised to not talk about your assets, it's sometimes it's unnatural to speak about what you have, but when, especially when it comes to protecting those assets, sort of like a, like a, once again, drawing a parallel to a doctor. If you don't tell the doctor what's wrong or what's, uh, you know, where the pain is, then it's pretty hard to solve for that. So what does our process look like? Uh, Diego touched on it a little bit too. I'll hit again is education. I would actually term this as pre-education. I wouldn't even say this is a full measure of the education. Uh, we actually, from all of our clients, uh, we'll go through tax and asset protection as a full one day class at this point. It actually used to be three days, uh, but with the digital world, we sort of scrunched it down to one. There's another step called structure implementation. Uh, which is basically now that you have your entities, here's what Anderson's going to do to help you keep them compliant. Here's what you need to be doing to help keep them compliant. And step three is called tax wise. So now that you have your entities, you know how to use them. Here's how to squeeze every cent out of them. And to me, this education piece is huge. And it's something that we do that I'd actually don't know of any other law firm that does the same thing. Uh, simply because from most times, if I'm bill, if I'm billing you hourly, I want you to be as pardon the, the, the phrasing here, but I want you to be as dumb as possible. So you constantly have to be calling me and I can bill you our model. We don't have an hourly rate. We have a monthly rate and you can utilize us as much as you want. Um, next question usually is as well, is it like just you out there or <laughs> no, I hired 20 attorneys last year and I'll probably hire another 20 this year. So we hire to keep up with our client demand as well. Uh, but we want you to utilize this. Like I said, we like the preventative side of this because you're not, you know, coming in with sirens blaring, talking about, you know, the emergency side of the legal business. So I like it. So education, Usually after the first class, you'll get your blueprint, or if you're going to utilize our uh, free strategy session, you'll get the blueprint during that call, and then the education might come after as well. But education, blueprint, and then even more education. So like I said, it's one thing that differentiates us. We are continually putting on classes and put, uh, putting out free content. So those of you who haven't, you know, if you're on YouTube and you haven't looked yet, you can just look up Anderson Advisors. You can see videos from Toby, Clint, myself. Um, if I haven't mentioned it, I'll mention it. I'm a little partial to Coffee with Carl, our little sub YouTube channel there. So those are just quick five minute videos that give you little clips of information. If you like how I've been speaking and some of it's been resonating, I'd invite you to like and subscribe to those so we can keep making them. Um, and then, like I said, real quick, just a quick reminder on those pieces that make or the building blocks of a great structure. You got to look at liability, tax, business, and the estate plan overall. With liability, we take a look at overall layering of your entity structure, including that piece with the anonymity. Uh, taxes, one thing I'll note is planning is key. You dropping your shoebox of receipts off at your poor CPA's office 
is not going to yield a lot of results. You actually need to spend timing. Uh, we do thousands of tax returns a year. And the people who spend time on planning, because we track this so we can say it at presentations, is basically for every hour spent on planning, uh, they usually tend to see a thousand, about a thousand bucks an hour in return for that planning. So there's some net benefit there to doing that planning. Uh, business plan, like I said, a lot of professionals out there, what they're going to miss is lendability. So one little tidbit that goes along with that business planning sort of involves tax as an illustration of how these things sort of cross into each other is if I'm trying to be more lendable and I've got a corporation within my entity structure, normally, if I'm a person who owns a C corporation, it is better that I own a C corporation than an S corporation, not because you're more or less likely to screw it up, but with an S corporation from a lendability standpoint, when your lender digs into your finances, they're gonna see your not only your personal income, but also that you received a K-1 from that S corporation, which raises the flag of, hey, this person owns that, so let's dig into the business. And especially if you have an investment-based or real estate-based business, a lot of times that corporation's not gonna be there to sit there to show a ton of profit. It's gonna be there to take different types of losses that you couldn't do as an individual. I mean, the, the, the sort of tax code and sections for business and people is kind of wild. I mean, as an individual, the government is nice enough to let us earn. They tax us on what we earn, and then we get to spend what's left over. From a corporate perspective, you get to earn, spend, and then get taxed on what's left over. So we use corporations quite a bit uh, in our tax planning because it provides that flexibility with the differences between those two areas of the tax code. And then finally, once again, the estate planning, like I said, imagine the estate plan as a suitcase that puts everything in the suitcase. Uh, ultimately, there's a lot of things in this life we don't get to choose. The appropriate estate plan is one of those ones that's sort of hanging out there as a thing that everybody should do. So, you know, like I said, there's not a whole lot of big flashing lights that say, hey, do this. This is one of those areas that's a big flashing light that says do this so you can avoid the issues on the back end. And I would bet just looking at the numbers on our event or informational event today, that at least somebody within this group has had, a, had to go through a terrible probate with a family member. So um, just an FYI there. Now, as part of y'all being awesome audience and sitting around and listening to all my information and chatting with y'all today, uh, we would invite anybody who wants to, to have a free strategy session. There is no commitments, but, or, you know, but wait, there's more kind of a thing. It's literally, if you'd like a free strategy session, please, I think they'll put the link in the chat section, please click it and you will have a strategy session with one of our advisors or one of our attorneys, and we will help put a plan together for you. Um, also, just as a reminder as well, uh, like I said, if you like the way I chat, put things simply, and I make short videos. Toby and Clint make very long videos. I make short <laughs> videos. Uh, if you like the little short video or kind of a frequently asked question type realm, uh, I would invite you and I would be pleased if you would like and subscribe to my YouTube channel, Coffee with Carl. Of course, it's associated with Anderson Advisors. And yeah, spend a little, you know, five minutes a week with me. I think Carl, your um, Coffee with Carl is, I, I like to call it sniper fire. Cause boom, you hit the target. <laughs> you're there with, with uh, the other two guys, you know, Toby and Clint. It's like shotgun blast. It, you're, you're getting a ton of information and at that point again it draws questions you know it, it, the curiosity and which is great because you guys are covering all the the spectrum of what 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 this is so we've got a couple questions if you want we want to go ahead and move into that carl if that's okay with you yeah you want me to read them or you want to read them it, it is up to you go ahead feel free okay um i'll just uh, i guess i'll start at the top and y'all can keep adding questions too this is y'all's time so i am happy to uh Keep going as long as you want. Well, to, within reason, I've made that mistake before. Um, yeah, <laughs> we'll, we'll make sure to, to hold the valve. <laughs> all 
All right, so first question is, if one is buying land first, what is the best entity to use? Uh, will you change the entity when you begin the new build? So question seems to be based around um, development. What I would look at is, is what is your intent with the property? So dealer status, which can be a little bit, which can be a bummer for real estate investors. I would say if you we were sitting there having a conversation, asking me a question, I'd say, well, what do you want to do with it? You're developing it. Are you developing to sell it, which is probably the most common route, or are you developing it to hold it? If you're developing to sell it, usually also from the lending perspective, they're going to want you to do everything in a single entity. So most of the big kids out there on the block that we're all familiar with, you know, like Lennar and those things, those folks, when they go to a new area, they basically set up an LLC for that area, usually tax it as some sort of corporation if they're going to sell all the properties and everything's usually done in one entity. So um, that's one of those weird ones that's just a practical perspective when working with a lender. If you're working with a lender for development, they want everything in one entity. They want they wanted to make they want to make life as easy as uh, possible on themselves, which you know, you got the money, you make the rules. Um, let's take a look here. I have a revocable living trust, good for my family's assets to avoid probate. And I'm at the final wording of an LLC for real estate investing. The trust contains wording that permits the grantors of the trust the latitude to utilize an LLC for business. It should, good. My question is whether to make the trust the manager member of the LLC or just use the names of the grantors. This is for Texas. Uh, I would have, so this is one of those practical perspective things. Logically, you would think it's living trust and trustee as member manager of the LLC. Uh, the reality is, is it's easier to file with the grantors in those positions and then assign that membership interest to the living trust. So that's one of those, once you've done it a thousand times, you learn. Um, but yeah, ultimately the living trust will fill those roles uh, for filing purposes though. It's usually not set up that way. All right. Uh, next one. So it sounds like land trusts are used to create an entity that keeps the true ownership unknown. Are they permissible in Texas? Good question. I have sat and argued with a bunch of old curmudgeon -y Texas lawyers <laughs> who can't read anymore. And they always like to say land trusts are illegal. And what they're referencing is actually a passive or dry trust in the state of Texas which is really just a matter of, if you can read the statute, is changing the terms to make sure that each of the roles in the land trust, whether it's the grantor, trustee, beneficiary, have distinct powers. So they can be illegal, to answer your question, uh, if you draft them poorly, but for the ones we create, they're not drafted poorly. I guess that's sort of the best straightforward answer that I can give you. And man, did I, have, I, I'll tell you all a quick story on that too, since we've got a few minutes here. Uh, so when I first started with Anderson, that was sort of my, one of my first tests was arguing with another Texas attorney over this thing. And they sent me a PowerPoint presentation from like the Underwriters Association. And the funny part was, is my entire argument came down to, you didn't even read your own first slide. Said the first slide says you need to read and distinguish every land trust from each other because they're not the same. And they did not like that. So that ended up in a dial tone type <laughs> conversation. Um, but yeah, so good question though. You were involved. <laughs> what I yeah, yeah. I'm not, uh, I don't know if you get the, if you all get the sense from me or not. I'm not one to, I'm not great at backing down from things. So <laughs> nice, nice. <laughs> Especially when some, like I say, some one of the old, some older attorney first addressed me as son when we picked up the phone, and it's like, well, I appreciate you're in the middle of nowhere, but you know, I deal with probably, like I said, we probably got at this point about forty thousand clients across all fifty yes. states. So uh, appreciate it, pops. But yeah, let's uh, <laughs> look at the law. Uh, all right, sorry. Next question here. 
I have a lady trying to sue my LLC. Okay. She says she as a walking past our home, the tenant's dog ran and knocked her down. There is no dog on the lease, no police report from the scene, and several loose dogs in the neighborhood. Thoughts? Um, I guess my original thought here, or my first thought would be, sounds kind of sketchy. Um, I don't know. If you actually see a lawsuit, talk to an attorney. But as far as what you can do at this moment, there's probably not a lot. Because really all you're going to get is threats until somebody files a lawsuit. But if nobody's filed a lawsuit yet, it would lead me to believe they don't think they got a whole lot. Um, so I would, I guess personally, if it was me, I would wait till they sued me and then tie in an attorney. Because it sounds, number one is it sounds like you have an LLC. So that's, that's good. Only downside is, I guess, if you're doing everything in that LLC, it's not super helpful. So if you got, you know, five, 10, 20 properties in there, that's not great. Um, but and still, until you actually get served with, or your, it wouldn't be you, until your LLC gets served with the lawsuit, I don't know, probably just a lot of saber rattling. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, I have an R1 development main with multi ADUs, breaking ground on three lots. I'd like to sell part ownership on one or two of those lots pre-construction. Can land trust be used to sell a portion? sell improvements, keep land, get paid over time. So you can do all those things. Um, what is sort of a red light flashing in my mind here is if you've got a lender on this property, you're gonna wanna be careful because <laughs> doing some of those things can hurt your, or uh, cause issues with your lender. Um, land trusts tend to be more helpful in non-commercial properties because the, the Garn St. Germain Act actually uh, applies to single family residences up to up to five units. So the commercial piece of this is probably what's concerning if you've got a loan on the property. I would just say the, the other part is too is if your lender finds out you sold part of this without telling them, at minimum, they're going to want to bring your partners in on the loan because they don't want to be any less secured than they've ever been. So can you do it? Yes. This one, I would suggest though, you probably need to work with your lender if you've got a commercial loan on the property. Okay. Um, let's see, what's the difference between land trust and living trust? Uh, great question, same family. So the parties would be the same. Uh, the land trust is drafted differently. So when I talk to my clients about it, I tell them, you know, it's sort of the, you gotta make sure you're using the right tool for the right job. Um, Land trust is meant to hold title to real property or real estate. Living trust is meant to hold basically everything. So where a land trust may be eight or nine pages, your living trust is probably 30, 40 or more, just because it needs to address all those different things. Personal items like jewelry um, or other membership interests in LLCs or shares in a corporation, you can use a personal property trust from a legal perspective, there's basically two types of property. There's real property and personal property. Real property is easy to mention or easy to note because it's basically real estate. Personal property is everything else. Mm -hmm. So, all right, have a rental property in LLC, good. Once sell property and terminate the LLC, do assets pass through to manager gain from sale of property? So first piece is depends on how the LLC is taxed. Um, most people who just go out and set up an LLC, usually it's taxed as a sole proprietor or what we would also term as disregarded. If that is the case here, which I would think it probably is, uh, basically it would fall onto your personal tax return from a sales perspective, the same way as you sold it individually. So if you've owned it for more than a year, you're looking at long-term capital gains. If you owned it for less than a year, usually short-term capital gains. Um, you could even do, still do something as well if you don't want to recognize those gains, like doing a 1031 exchange if you wanted to as well. So basically, from a tax perspective, the IRS doesn't see your LLC if you're a sole proprietor, tax is a sole proprietor, tax is disregarded, which is the default. So you can basically treat it like you sold it yourself. Okay. Um, is it a good idea to have a series LLC for real estate investing? Great question. So 
one of those things that always comes up when I'm in Texas. I think it's a cool tool. Downside to series tends to be this, unless you have a bank you know works for series and series sells, as well as a title company, uh, you can be creating yourself a little bit of a headache. There's also, I think, starting in June, they opened up a new law in Texas for series where you can actually file the series sell as well with the Secretary of State. So be aware of that. Sometimes those things that become an option become forced on you at some point. So some of the appeal <laughs> may start to go south here pretty yep. quick. The other piece is, is there's not a ton of case law on series. Um, so, you know, that can be a really good thing if you figure nothing's ever gone to judgment or nothing ever has been posted about it. Uh, it could also be a really bad thing in that it's not challenged. So it creates the unknown, which tends to hurt your bargaining position when you're the defendant. And it opens it up to interpretation. And that's, uh, that's a other, big one. Other, yeah, other pieces too, is if you're going to invest at all outside of Texas, you can't use that. You should not use that same series. Every, there's like 17 states that allow for series LLCs and their laws are different in every state. And I'm thinking of uh, Oklahoma, like an Oklahoma series. If you bring an Oklahoma series to Texas, Texas says it's one entity. It's not separate, mm -hmm. which is weird because Texas has a series too. So it's just, unless you're just going to be in Texas, I wouldn't consider a Texas series. Okay. And let's kill two birds with one stone here. Somebody just asked the question, what is a series LLC? Yeah. So what is a series LLC? If you picture a the only thing that's coming to mind is sort of an alien story here. It's sort of the mothership. And then you have a bunch of little sub ships as part of that mothership. So if you picture, yeah, usually the way I'll draw it out is a box with a bunch of little sub boxes off the side. So it's a single entity in that it's a series LLC, but you have sub entities within that single entity, which sort of shows you as well as why they can be a little bit complex from a legal perspective because from the outside, it kind of looks like one LLC. The mm -hmm. only thing that creates the difference right now is your bookkeeping and records. Once the new change goes through, I think in June, you'll have the ability to file those cells with the state, which will show the different cells. But right now, like I say, it's a little, little gray as far as the separation. Uh, also, anybody who um, is considering a series, I also say build into your budget having professional bookkeeping and tax advice as well, because like I said, that's the separation that's really creating the protection between those cells. Perfect. And how long does it take for Anderson to create a Texas LLC? Good question. A little bit complex. So from our side, I can get you an LLC's documentation probably within 24 hours. However, how long does it take for Texas to get back to us? Uh, can be a little bit longer. For most parts, what I'm going to say if somebody asks is generally I figure about two to three weeks. So the idea is, is if you identify a property, want an entity set up, if you tell me once you've identified it, had an offer accepted, my goal is to make sure to have it to you by the time you're ready to close. Okay. And communication is a big one. <laughs> yes. Yep. All like, right. But then you've got, you know, Pennsylvania, which their standard now is six weeks to turn around. Whoa. <laughs> All right. So we're selling a property and using a 1031 exchange. The property is in our personal name now. How do we change this to be an LLC when we exchange to the next property? So your qualified intermediary is going to want you to take title in that property in your name. That's okay. And then basically you can transfer it over. The key in transferring it, and I, I mean, I would probably leave it for a year if it was me. Um, when I would transfer it over though, as long as the entity you're transferring it to is the same taxpayer. So once again, if I've got an LLC that's disregarded ultimately back to me, then you're fine. So like I said, from my perspective, I would probably wait a year before I put it in an LLC. Um, if you're going to do this in the future, if you have other properties, you can also do the 1031 in the LLC the next time. So if say you, this property you eventually want to sell, you can, if you want to 1031 it, do it the same way. IRS just looks at the taxpayer. 1031 exchange is because it's located in IRC, Internal Revenue Code, Section 1031. 
Um, but the IRS is looking at the taxpayer. So you can mm -hmm. actually do 1031 exchanges and land trusts. You can do them in LLCs. You can pretty much do them anywhere where the, where the uh, taxpayer is not changing. So, yeah. All right, Carl. And so for them to get a hold of you, um, obviously you have coffee with Carl. You have the link, which has been uh, um, uh, put into the chat box and you guys can also uh, confirm that there or go to it. Is this the appropriate information page for them to go to to get to see you? Can you see it here on, on what was just shared? Yeah, yeah, our website's great. And you'll have the ability to take advantage of any of the classes offered on there as well. So yeah, that's great. Which are, those are awesome. <laughs> the, yeah, the classes are awesome, guys. It, it doesn't hurt to make that, that, that call and, and, and find out. And, and, and Carl, so, you know, so thank you so much for your time. I know we had a lot of people ask questions. Also, for those of you guys that are SVI members already, remember that you can find Anderson's full uh, benefits with us at, in our uh, network vendors directory, and you can definitely uh, get more information on that. So these are, I want to thank some of our great partners and affiliates that we have with, with the, within the SVI family, and also people that are new to us know that uh, you can meet us at our uh, webpage and do some one-on-ones with us, which Every single one of these key points here, you're going to need to talk to Carl eventually. <laughs> That's, that is a must. Some of our PMLs, go talk to Carl. Go talk to Anderson because that's a whole other spectrum of knowledge there. If you have the money, you may not want to do the work of the investing side, but you need to make sure you're prepping yourself perfectly for the lending side. And if you need a copy of the presentation. Remember, it's going to be posted in our YouTube channel at Strata Ventures on YouTube. You can also call us or email us at info at strataventures.com or investorrealestatetraining.com. You can find more of our events and then you can like and subscribe us there. And also, again, it's always a pleasure working with uh, uh, Anderson Advisors. You guys are the cream of the crop of what you, got, of what you guys do. You guys are awesome. So... Do you have a, any final messages or words before we go ahead and, and uh, close out? No, thank you so much for having me. Uh, for those of you who are aware of public speaking, you're not supposed to thank everybody, but you know, I just sort of feel my uh, mom's hand behind my head if I didn't say thanks for everybody for having me and thank you for the great hospitality. And I look forward to working with all of you. Absolutely, same here, Carl. It's great seeing you, sir. Everybody have a wonderful evening and we'll catch you guys in two weeks and make sure to go to our landing page, investorrealestatetraining.com because in the event section, I believe the next one we have is Airbnb financing with one of our main lenders. So that's going to be a great session. All right. Thanks, Carl. Have a wonderful evening, guys. Thanks.